William Ambrose Spicer wasn't born Seventh-day Adventist, but he converted around 14 years old after attending revival meetings and reading the Great Controversy. When he was only 16, he had to drop out of high school to care for his father, who had recently endured a stroke. Spicer needed a job, and he found one at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Young William worked all day and took secretarial courses by night. At 22, he moved to England when former conference president Stephen Haskell offered him a job. Haskell was a missionary to England. But interestingly, England was sending navies, merchants, scientists, and others to the far reaches of Africa and India. Around the world, Western colonialism was spreading. Powerful countries were driven by economic and political gain, ethnocentric beliefs about race superiority, and the thrill of exploration. The motivation to colonize distant lands even got mixed up with religion. And though the reasons for missions were muddied by some, it's undeniable that colonialism helped lay the groundwork for honest, Christ-centered missionaries to reach out in love. At this point, Seventh-day Adventist missions was like a base jumper at the edge of a precipice. So much potential, ready at any second, like a toddler learning to walk, like a handful of lycopodium powder sitting next to a candle, waiting to get shaken up, primed to ignite. And William Spicer was the breeze to do it. The Spicer wind began to blow in 1892 when he was named secretary of the newly minted Foreign Missions Board. Only one year later, an African prime minister donated 12,000 acres of farmland to the Adventist church. This allowed Spicer to establish the Salusi Mission in Zimbabwe, the first of hundreds of African missions. In 1898, Spicer received two notices. The first calls for a missionary to Africa, the second to India. After prayer and a family meeting, Spicer accepts the call to India. He becomes a missionary and editor of the first American periodical in India. Oriental Watchman. But Spicer didn't erupt into a gale force until after he returned to the United States several years later. He would serve A.G. Daniels as secretary during Daniels' term as conference president. And then Daniels would return the favor when Spicer became president. Together, these two led the church for the first 30 years of the 20th century. And they would do for Adventist missions what Henry Ford did for the automobile industry. Ford was visiting a meatpacking plant when he realized that all the workers stood still while the product came to them. Why not do the same for cars? Suddenly, the industrial assembly line was born. Infrastructure. Groundwork. Around the turn of the century, it became clear that the church's top-down style of government was failing. While appropriate to a small, localized church, this method ceased to be effective as the church stretched across continents and oceans. A.G. Daniels suggested union conferences handing the responsibilities to locals on the ground, familiar with the specific needs of that region. During the reign of Western imperialism, leaders like Teddy Roosevelt employed battleship diplomacy. In the midst of a nonviolent conflict, one country's naval fleet would show up on the other's shores, posturing all its power. This showmanship was usually enough to resolve the issue in favor of the team with the biggest guns. This mindset infected foreign missions too, and Spicer knew it. He raised the issue of American nationalism saying, it does one no good to take along from America a national feeling into the field. Missionaries had too often erected a barrier between himself and every soul who is not an American. William Spicer wrote at least eight books and never owned a car. He always traveled coach on trains and he wouldn't buy anything he couldn't pay for in cash. Our Adventist College in India is named for him. Before Spicer, in 1880, the church had eight overseas missions. In 1890, still only eight. But by 1900, there were 42. Then, 87 in 1910, 153 in 1920, and in 1930, 270 missions in over 50 countries. That's three Adventist foreign missionaries for every one employed stateside. Spicer stirred the air and the lycopodium powder exploded into flames. The church's membership was growing as numerous as the stars. When I say steamship, you probably think of the Titanic. And you are either thinking of a very terrible tragedy or a very long movie. Either way, 
Passengers tell us that the only thing worse than swimming for your life from a sinking steamship is having to live on board one. On Christmas Eve 1901, Jacob Nelson Anderson led the first three commissioned Adventist missionaries to China. With their four-year-old son, Stanley, they left their home in Wisconsin and traveled by train to San Francisco. From there, they boarded a steamship bound for Hong Kong. This was 10 years before anyone would dare to claim a steamship could be unsinkable. At the time, everyone carried living memory of tragedies like the Independence, which crashed into a reef off the Northern California coast, losing 150 passengers and crew. If our missionaries traveled in the steerage deck, then they were packed in like cattle with the cargo. When the miserable food was dealt out of huge kettles into dinner pails, the strong would shove and bully. Two to four hundred people might sleep in the same room on bunks. Privacy was impossible. Available restrooms often equated to pots and pans. Unsanitary conditions frequently led to death. Did you catch that? Just being on a steamship could kill you. No icebergs necessary. And the trip takes a minimum of three weeks. Upon arrival, J.N. Anderson's escort failed to meet the missionary team. Stranded and exhausted, they immediately realized yet another challenge, communication. Mandarin doesn't use the Western alphabet, but unique characters for every word. Its grammar doesn't come from verb tenses, but from tonal inflection. Standing there with bags in hand, our missionaries probably felt a lot like astronauts setting foot on Mars. But they believed the work was important enough to take the risk, to make the sacrifice. J.N. Anderson's diary records him as a man with a rich heart for the land and its people. He and the others were committed. The first task was to learn the language. It took two years. The next task was getting from Hong Kong to mainland China. This only proved possible because of the efforts of other missionaries, both official and unofficial. J.N. Anderson met his neighbors, shopped at local markets, and shared his faith. On Valentine's Day, 1903, Anderson baptized six Chinese converts to Adventism. That's how the church started in China. Six people. Anderson's appeals to the General Conference scored four doctors and two nurses, the beginning of Adventist medical missionary work in China. A Chinese church headquarters were established. Anderson's sister-in-law formed the first Adventist school. Anderson's younger brother was so inspired that he made the steamship journey out and joined the efforts. In the spring of 1906, J.N. Anderson passed the torch to Nga Pit Ke, ordaining him as the first Chinese minister in the SDA church. This one action opened the door for dozens of other Chinese church members to join in, spreading the good news. Today, in China, there are over 400,000 Adventist believers and 4,571 congregations.